I'm Jason Collier. I'm the CTO and one of the co-founders here at Scale Computing. Um, the uh, like Stephen said, you can follow me on Twitter at, at Bocanuts. If you got any questions about anything we're talking about, feel free to shoot me an email at uh, Collier at uh, ScaleComputing.com. As Stephen mentioned, we've been we've been around for a while. We actually started the company back in 2007. And uh, we started shipping a, a effectively a unified scale out storage product. And everybody always thought, you know, when we're shipping this storage product, scale computing, that's a hell of a stupid name for a storage company, right? Well, our entire premise, like, like what we were going for is now this whole like world that's called hyperconvergence, right? We always wanted to basically take and integrate this virtualization stack in with the storage. And I want to start, um, with, with basically just you know a couple of quick uh, you know comments about hyperconvergence and what is it, you know what does the term even mean, you know it's like so you see hyperconvergence oh is that just one step better than convergence well then why didn't you call it superconvergence or hella convergence or <laughs> super awesome convergence, the reality is the term came from and I remember this very specific briefing we were having with an analyst that actually coined the term hyperconvergence, when. Our definition of what it was, was integrating a converged stack of servers and storage with a hypervisor component. So what we see is, is really, is, is basically hyperconvergence is, and, and is kind of was originally defined to be hypervisor converged. Now what you've seen happen in the industry, you've got effectively two classifications of, of companies that are effectively stack owners or stack dependents. And effectively a stack owner, basically there's effectively no VM in the data path. And right now there are two main companies that do um, basically that. One, it's us, and we've been doing it for two and a half years, and VMware when they came out with vSAN. Everybody else is effectively a stack dependent solution where they're running as a VSA on top of a pre-existing hypervisor within an environment. For us, we actually provide uh, the hypervisor services. So, you know, one of the things like we run KVM, but the reality is we run KVM. We control KVM. KVM does not control us. So that is kind of a big differentiator from where we are with some of the other folks that you think of like in the actual hyperconverged space. What we really wanted to uh, uh, service in the industry was we wanted to create a solution for SMB and mid-market companies. We exclusively serve SMB and mid-market companies and there's one problem, one very specific problem that we wanted to solve and that was the complexity of the modern virtualized infrastructure. We target companies that are probably 50 to 5,000 employees but more importantly those guys that are like the one to five person IT shops and up to say even even like one to ten or one to basically like a dozen uh, IT guys in the organization but we don't go after fortune 500 we don't go after organizations that have like a team of SAN experts that run their environment we don't have a team of you know network experts or or the team of virtualization experts. We really target those guys uh, within the organization that have you know, one to five IT guys, they're the generalists. They're doing everything from fixing the CEO's email on his iPhone in the morning you know, to basically making sure their exchange server, their CRM system, all that stuff is up and running. But when you look at how virtualization's been done for the last 10 or 15 years, this is kind of that standard 3 to one architecture uh, of virtualization where you've got you know, a shared storage platform, you had you know, a SAN or NAS sitting down there that's, that's providing those shared storage components. You've got basically a networking layer. It could be, you know, could be Cisco, HP, Dell switches sitting up there. You've got your host servers, you know, HP, Dell, IBM, um, that the, the are sitting there running. And then the hypervisor services running on top of that. That could be VMware, Citrix. It adds a lot of complexity into that environment and one of the things that we wanted to solve was basically the simplification of all that because not only do you have to deal with all these disparate systems from a management perspective you got to deal from it from a support perspective and when you're that SMB or mid-market guy you don't have a hell of a lot of resources to spread out uh, to, to, to manage the, the complexity of that environment so when we we took back we, we took a, a, a step back and said a lot of these components were not designed with virtualization in mind. 
They, 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 they put SANS and they put NASAs in the virtualization environment because they needed shared storage and that's the way that they got it done today. But it wasn't built for virtualization, right? It's, it, it's a tool that was taken to, to fix a specific problem from 20 years ago and we're like, oh, let's just bolt that in and see how that fits. Well, every time you inject one of these areas of complication into the infrastructure, you create three more problems. Like you, you put the sand in the environment. Now, okay, now I have to all the, have all the sand uh, monitoring, and I got to do provisioning, and it's basically just increased the complexity so much that enterprises can handle it by having more staff. The SMB and mid-market guys, they can't handle doing it this way, but they want the same benefits. They want high availability for their applications. So what we thought of was, what if we just took all these preconceived notions of how things should be done, cut it out, and um, basically build a system for virtualization? And, and what we did was we, we, we collapsed that stack down to where it looked like uh, effectively the simplicity of a single server within an environment. So. What we did and scale our HC3 product that you see sitting here right in front of you, this is combined servers, storage, virtualization, all wrapped up into this appliance and this, this, this deployment form factor. You start with a minimum of three nodes within an environment and you can effectively add a node at a time depending on what the, what the needs for your organization are. Um, so in doing that, um, by the time you rack and stack this gear, 10 minutes after you got it racked and stacked, you effectively assign an IP, initialize the cluster, and you're up and deploying virtual machines in the environment. So the three core design tenets, once again, we built this for mid-size organizations. We did not build this for enterprise. We, we, we built this for, uh, like I said, that, those, those uh, you know, one to five man IT shops. And the three core design tenets of the product are simplicity, high availability and scalability. We wanted the simplicity of you know, you know, deploying an application on a single server solution. We wanted this to be really uh, you know, pretty much as easy as it could possibly be. We wanted high availability out of the box, not something you have to configure, not something you have to go to you know, uh, two, two weeks of VMware school to learn how to set up a clustered environment, right? Out of the box, it's highly available. If I lose a node, I go unplug that thing, my VMs are going to fail over to, to the other nodes within the cluster. And then scalability. You, can, you don't have to overbuy. You don't have to buy for what your projected needs are in three years. You buy for what you need today, and you can non-disruptively add a node at a time into the environment to effectively scale the system out. With that, I'm going to jump into the demo. So we've got, never mind this, so obviously we're... we're, we're uh, you know, we're, we're, we're slim, we're trim, uh, and we don't have any redundant connections set up or anything on this, right? So uh, uh, we are uh, definitely, uh, you know, going at this from, from the, uh, kind of from the, uh, the skinny solution. But what you see here, this is, this is this cluster that you're, you know, looking at right here, good old uh, Skywalker. Um, and so we got a four node system, you know, we got a couple of virtual machines running, we're setting up, uh, uh, Mike's setting up some templates over here. Um, Still 620s? Uh, these? <laughs> three no, 20s. these are 320s. Oh, okay. Yeah, little known fact. Yeah, we've we we've, yeah. we've been a partner. We've been a partner at Dell for a long time. So, <laughs> so Why not? you know, because they make great hardware. You, you get they they make great hardware. We have a 620 offering. And we do. For replacing equipment, right? Yeah. So, do you, yeah. so uh, to that question specifically, my yeah. name is not the technology. Yeah, yeah. That's a support, big support kind of thing. Absolutely. When it comes to parts replacement, etc. Yep. You don't really have much proprietary in the box. No. Does. There you is nothing proprietary. You leverage the Dell support chain, which is everywhere, you know, yes, pretty much do. every country. Yep. So when a part fails, do they contact you and then you guys commission Dell to do it, or they contact Dell yep. direct? They, they contact us. Yeah. We are the single point of contact for everything. Okay. All hardware, all software, uh, any type of support, uh, basically they, they contact us and we handle it all through that fulfillment chain. Okay. So. And then, boom. Dell the only hardware provider? No, we have, uh, so we have three different hardware platforms. We've got our HC 1000, 2000, and 4000 systems. The 1000 is a 320, 4000 is a 620. Uh, getting ready to switch those over both to the 30 families, basically the 13G platforms. Um, and then our 1000 is effectively a super micro uh, based chassis. Uh, it's, it's basically kind of the entry level. It's a SATA based system. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just kind of geared for that, you know, that, that, that entry component. But yeah, those are, those are you know, 
320s and 620s are our primary uh, deployment platform for it. So you have different modules that have different. Yep. CPU, memory, disk. Absolutely. So that's yeah, each one of those. So the 1000 is 32 gig of RAM. Um, like I said, disks are, are SATA based in that. You can do 1 gig or 10 gig uh, in those. Um, 2000 is 64 gig. And the, um, the, the HC 4000 product is 128 gig uh, per node uh, within the system. So, and, and those are basically the 2000 and 4000 are also SAS based. And um, the 4000 is actually 10 gig only. So if I bought one of these and they rolled up on a little stack like that, yep. I power it up and I see this interface, I don't have to go with, uh, butts around with KBM and down. Nope, and nope, you, you, nope, none of that. You, it so are you going to build that out for VMware or Hyper-V? No. No. Because, <laughs> and Phil's going to talk <laughs> about the architecture. <laughs> yeah. No, no, like, because... Most people would be KBM bullshitting, like, like right. well, you know, we've got plans in Q4. To, and he's like, no, we're not going to do that. No. <laughs> we're not going to do that. We said, like, honestly, like, VMware is our primary competitor in the marketplace. <laughs> so, VMware, like, like, like our, our goal is to put VMware out of business. I mean, that's a lofty goal. <laughs> but at the same time, um, you know, it's... Uh, you know, we, we don't plan on going into the enterprise. We have built this thing specifically for this, but nobody is going in. Nobody's futzing around with like basically KVM, you know, command line stuff to basically start up VMs. Everything is done within the interface. Uh, you compile my X. No, nope. none, none of that stuff. We we actually so we run our own effectively. This is our own distributional Linux that we've created. That's effectively based off of Red Hat Enterprise Linux, a scale computing Enterprise Linux, um, but. Everything, and, and Phil is going to go into great detail on this, but we have our entire orchestration stack that we have built on top of this uh, that controls all of those components. Like I said, we don't run as like a VSA on top of KVM. We, we run basically as a root storage mechanism that ties directly into QEMU and KVM as the storage pathing component. So we've eliminated all those storage protocols and uh, basically made something that's exceptionally simple but also exceptionally flexible uh, you know, at the same time. We wanted, you know, like I said, simplicity was that core design tenet. And we wanted something that you, know, you bring it in, you plug it in, 10 minutes after you rack and stack it, the thing is ready to go. And if you accidentally trip over the power cord while you're moving it, you can get back to life in five minutes. <laughs> yeah, and because and we just did that when we were moving it from one uh, the, the one side of the room to the other. The uh, yeah. So we care, obviously, but from a customer's point of view, do they ever need to really care or know that it's KVM nope. based? They need to know that it runs their Windows and Linux applications. So upgrades, right? anything like that, they don't ever need to get in that far. Nope. What about guest uh, type, guest software? We've done everything from we we've done DOS, OS2, Plan9, BIOS, uh, Solaris. Uh, we we have run a lot of stuff. We actually have a customer that is actually running two OS2 instances that they're using. It's a, like a regional banking company that is doing. Uh, they, they still do that for basically their their financial wire transfer stuff. We are running OS2 instances on. Uh, basically, on on, on the, the 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 platform. I mean, if it'll ver if it'll run on x86, we can virtualize it on the platform. Yeah. So, are you running like old voicemail systems? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we're running any of those, but you know, it, it could happen. <laughs> Anything is possible. Good old OS2. Um, so this interface. So so this. By the way, this is all once again simplicity. This is no thick client. This is Google Chrome. Right, I'm in a web browser. Uh, I'm hooked to Skywalker here, so we're we're, we're hooked to like I said this guy, and uh, these are the four nodes. That's a representation of basically the memory footprint on each one of those nodes. So this is basically you're seeing the the, the RAM footprint. These have 128 gig uh, uh, per, and then these are our basically the virtual machines that are running on this. We went to kind of a tabulated browser. Now I'm going to show you. So once again, getting to this point in the system is 10 minutes after you get it racked and stacked. Right? You're, you basically configure IPs for the nodes, initialize the cluster, you're here. So I'm going to go ahead and create a virtual machine. And really, so thinking back to that 3 to one architecture, I don't want you to think more about what I have to do when creating a VM. Think about what I don't have to do when I'm creating a virtual machine. So we'll go in here. We're going to call this one Collier. Description Collier. Give it a tag Collier. I'm going to create my own little group here. Um, so I basically can pick the OS. Basically, it's Windows or other. Um, we'll, we'll go ahead and do. Uh, we'll go ahead and do Windows. The performance drivers. This is actually effectively the Vert I/O drivers that run on KVM. We automatically mount those things and get them ready to fire up whenever you we go back to the OS dropdown for a second and just yeah. drop it down. Windows, other. other. 
<laughs> simple. 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 Reality is so Linux like pretty much auto detects when it's being run on KVM, and it automatically installs the performance drivers on its own. So you really don't have to do anything. So you know. Funny thing is, like, I'm almost even considering we should probably just take that out, just to simplify it. You the, know, drivers it's like <laughs> for, the drivers for Windows, are they native in particular OSs? Or it is the same as KVM, so it's basically the uh, you know same as like what Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization would be. And these are Vert I/O drivers that specifically do um, block I/O acceleration for the network adapters and for the um, uh, disks. Okay, when so, you're installing Windows, do you need to? F6 and stick those drivers in so Windows sees the... You don't need to F6, but basically you just, it's going to have a drive pre-mounted that you go in there and specify that. And I, I can show you that, I mean, uh, as we go through this. We can pick the number of cores that you want to assign to this particular uh, uh, virtual machine. This actually changes depending on the model that you've got. If you've got one of our HC4Ks, it's like 24 cores uh, that you can slap in there. This just happens to be the, a single, um, uh, single hex core with multi-threading. And uh, then pick, pick the, the, the number of um, uh, amount of RAM. I'm going to go 16 because we've got 120 gig of RAM and to actually have it show up when I start it up. Um, need to do that. The drive, Phil's going to go into this in, in more detail. So this is my C drive. If I want to add another uh, you know, additional drive onto this, it's going to be my data drive. So you do like 500 gig and come down here and specify my ISO. Here's my Win, uh, Windows Server uh, 2K12. Click create and done. Notice I, I didn't click a next anywhere in the process of creating that virtual machine. Virtual machine's created. It's done. I didn't go into a storage system. I didn't go. I didn't have to, you know, carve out LUNs. I didn't have to do RAID sets. I didn't have to uh, format it VMFS. I didn't have to do any of that stuff. That effectively just created the virtual machine on top of this uh, in a highly available fashion. So, question. Yep. Uh, I want to join it to the domain. I want to do any customization. Mm -hmm. Templates, et cetera. Templates, yeah. Okay, so yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get into that. Um, so I'm actually going to fire this up. So I go through and say I want my gold master image. Here's my gold master. I got all my patches done to it. This is what I want to take and make all my deployments out. We actually utilize, and, and Phil, you may want to chime in on this, but, but we do um, you know, kind of a, a, a version of cloning. So once this is up, we actually do blocked reference cloning. So when you do that, so here's the cool thing about it. You create that, that initial instance. When you clone it out, you can take this VM, say, well, by the time that operating system is installed, um, it's, uh, you know, say, 6 gig in size. You clone that 1,000 times, that takes up 6 gig of space total because we actually do block reference cloning on, uh, on the, you know, basically the way that works. So then we maintain the block level differentials so between that. Side, easy. Yeah. Just prep all those types of things which we yeah. can normally do. Now, what's yep. the ease of actually uh, mitigating, is handling that? Pretty much the same way. I mean, it's like so. Sys prep it. Take your gold image. Go in. Sys prep it. Clone it out. So like you just you're good to go. It, you know, yeah. like what would be the steps? You'd click on something and then so go through. That. You know, I mean, this this will be go through. Do the installation process. Oh, and by the way, so. Um, You'll see that you know when I start, I hit that power button. That started up, started up on that third node in the cluster. Uh, this to talk a little bit about the, uh, um, the, you know, some of the technology in the orchestration stack. We monitor several thousand different conditions on every node within the cluster. So when you do something like you're instantiating a state change by um, uh, uh, going through and uh, you know starting a VM, so we look at things like you know what's the overall like you know load utilization on these on these boxes and determine the best place to start things up. And this cluster is a little bit boring now because there's not that much running on it. Um, but you know, we, we look at those things, and that's really that's really where where it comes into kind of the state machine, the orchestration stack technology, determining uh, wh where it actually does the placement on that. So. Um, you know, like I said, it's going to look at that. It's going to determine the best place uh, uh, for the placement on that. And then, um, once again, still from within the browser, I mean, if I just go in here, click the console, and apparently I picked the wrong... It was a CentOS. Yeah. Here's, my, here's my CentOS. <laughs> <laughs> I like CentOS better anyway. Uh, the, so, so anyway, it's going through and doing the, uh, uh, you know, do, do, doing that, the, the installation component. But that's all still done from within the web browser itself. Um, We've, uh, um, I'm trying to think just from a, uh, but is it the, the, the customization is, is a clone with sysprep, but there isn't a guest customization part like you have in vCenter where you can go and inject name and IP addresses and that kind of thing. You basically create a 
a VM shut it, uh, sysprep it, shut it down, and then you can go and deploy it a million times. But there's going to yep. be, it's not going to be those extra bells and whistles within here to go and customize it, customize basically. It. Right, yeah. right, right. No, no, that's right. I mean, yeah. but when, when we do the clonings, we do things like, uh, like if you're going to clone it out, it's going to basically clone different MAC addresses. It's going to do, you know, all, all of those components like standard when you think about but how, let's how say, you clone that. Let's but, say I want to join it to the domain. Let's say when I fire it up, I want to, maybe. you know, have it. Uh, there's nothing specific that we do that, you know, that helps gonna, that process. You don't need it at a cloud or enterprise say, environment that's going to do a thousand. Uh, I mean, you can still do SMB, that. SMB, right, maybe right. Not a, yeah, yeah. For the target. Tender text file. File. Yeah, yeah. file. Stuff. It, mm. it, it, Possibly, yeah. yeah. And once again, I'm yeah. bearing in mind too, this is not, we, we are not building this for enterprise. We're building this for that guy that wants to run like like 50 virtual machines in his tire and Set it and forget it type 2. 50 virtual machines by not having to do the exact same steps over and over again. He wants to be able to do other things. He wants to do other things. We can say he doesn't want to because it's only 50 machines, but one machine and two machines take just as long as 50 machines. Yeah, but even doing that and taking it, get, getting that basically gold image, you get it installed, you get it patched, and you put you, and you basically sysprep it. I mean, it's, it's not that hard to do. But it's not going to do the full on like joining the AD domain and stuff like that. But think about the, the life that he's living now. Is he paying for those advanced features in VMware? No. I mean, you know, you can do the. The time taken to actually go and create the gold image for one that you're going to use twice versus just. Doing yeah. it. Because yeah. you yeah. install it and then well, it runs. Too, but yeah. If we're talking up to 50, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ease I, of entry, the ease of access for I, I get your point, you. but well, all 50 yeah. don't get built day one. 50 is what happens over two and a half exactly. years. Yeah. So you build yeah. two and then you build another three and then, so, access. yes. It's uh, it's all the market, right? Yeah, I mean, right. It, it's basically the, the, market, the, the, the market that we focus on, the market that we go after. So um, this may not. But yeah. it, wouldn't be, it wouldn't even be a major deal to even create a <clears throat> sysprep. Disk that you mount as yeah, a floppy. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, you could create a virtual floppy or something. Yeah, right. But I mean, you know, I mean, it would be something yeah, that they could. We do. I mean, yeah, and we do. Yeah. We do Pixie on yeah. on our stuff all the time. So um, the, the 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 whole point is like this was built to be you know exceptionally simple. We've got uh, one of our uh, one of our systems engineers actually uh, put a video uh, put a video on YouTube of his daughter going through and creating basically a Windows 2008 server. Do you have any scripting engines or anything? We've got it underneath the hood. Okay. Yeah. But anyway, his, like, you put is this video accessible? on with his daughter doing it. His daughter's four years old. It's not like she went to, she's not a V expert, right? She didn't go through a bunch of VMware classes to do it. She's four. She was rewarded in chocolate chips for being able to create virtual machines, right? So, so, so you know, the customers that the, the we go after are, are really, you know, they, they, they are looking at, you know, basically how, how easy is this to, to run and deploy in my environment. Um, you know, the, the other things that we do have in here, so if I want to do things like, you know, live migrate the VM, I mean, I can come down here to the VM, click on move. Let's say I want to move that to, like, say, the first node in the cluster. Just basically pick that, and we're doing the live migration. Because we use that clustered storage back end, we're not doing any type of storage copy. This is effectively just doing a, a memory state copy, much like a vMotion uh, would work uh, in that environment. So now we've... You're doing a gig switching there, or are you doing... Yeah, it's just LACP or anything to that's no. yeah, that's that's one gig. Yeah, we we do run uh, basically we do run bonding, but we're a bunch of uh, cheap asses, so we don't even have half of them plugged in. <laughs> so <laughs> we're only going. We're 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 only running like a, those Cat Five cables are darn expensive, man. It's like, we ain't gonna plug those things in. Are you, your, so. your distributed file system. Are you using like DRBD or what? What are you? You'll see it. Bill, I'll let you. It's called Scribe. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit of oh, detail cool. right. later. Yeah. But uh, yeah, and we covered it also in uh, Storage Field Day Five. I, I yeah, believe, yeah. Pretty in depth. In, so. very, yeah, very in depth on that one. Uh, so, so, if you really want all the are nuts your and APIs bolts exposed? I mean, can we can expose our APIs? Um, once <clears throat> again, this is like coming down to the market that the, that we have been. So everything that I'm doing in the interface can be done and scripted from the command line. We don't currently expose that. Once again, market focus. We are we are you know we are maintaining a laser focus on SMB and mid market. We actually had a a very good customer opportunity that came up from a, 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 a let's just say they're a, they're a pretty established app provider for like developing iPhone apps and. Um, they had a lot of Linux stuff that they were doing. They wanted to do a lot of scripting. Um, for us, we saw that as a deviation from what that laser focus of the customer base that we're going after. Can we do it? Yes, we can. Do we do it? Typically not, because we are, once again, um, 
like I said, maintaining kind of that, that laser focus on that market. Because we have, um, so, you know, a little known fact uh, about scale, actually it might be somewhat known, but we, um, since we launched this product, we launched it at uh, VMworld two and a half years ago. Yeah, they found out we weren't using VMware, and needless to say, they haven't invited us back since then. Um, why would you choose to launch it at yeah. VMworld, just to push the stick in? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We were actually hoping they'd kick us out. We thought that'd be kick-ass PR, right? Yeah, it'd be, it'd be. <laughs> so, so, but, but we did do it. You know, they found out. We were like, oh, look That's at true. this. Here's this, this hyper-converged solution. This thing is great. Well, you'd be setting what? a tent up alongside yeah. Hyper-V, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's um, so so. But we did that, and in that that two and a half year uh, time span, so for, since we launched the product, we have over a thousand customers. So we have over a thousand customers that have deployed this solution. Um, that that equates over like four thousand five hundred of these boxes that have been shipped out into the space. So, so general purpose question. I yep. go there. I unplug node number one. Yep. What happens to the VM? Well, I tell you what. When we're done with our demos, you can come over here and do it. All right. Cool. Then we can find out. Whichever, well, whichever one happens to be one. It might be yeah, we're, we're going to show some other cool stuff. Uh, <laughs> some other cool stuff that, 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 that we're actually going to do with that. So, in terms of networking, is it just a single VLAN? Can you have multiple VLANs or SMBs? Don't we can do. It? Yeah, we do. We do. We actually do. We support multiple VLANs in there. So, so we do do a lot of things like you know we can do VLAN tagging and and those components where you can actually set up. You know, typically it's like finance needs to be on their own little network. Okay. And and yeah, we have ways to basically go through and set up the VLAN tagging uh, within the system. So, is there like an advanced version of the screen or is this it? Nope, it's pretty much it. That's it? Yep. <laughs> built to be simple. I think the answer would be anything. <laughs> <I know. laughs> yeah. That's right. This so is built to be easy. I can move <laughs> VMs, I can do all this stuff, and we're going to show you a, a cooler demo that you guys are really going to get a kick out of. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> All right. Can, can, I, I just wanted to defer right, that right. to the next part of the demo. Okay, no, that's all right. Because <laughs> that's what someone's saying. I've got this. All right, wait. Now how do I back it up? Yep. Yeah. So we have multiple ways in which we can back it. I'll go ahead and show you like one way that we can do that is, uh, and this is something that can actually be you know scripted into the system. Like here's this uh, VM that I got. I can literally export that VM like out to a remote share. Uh, this is something that can be scripted uh, into the system. So if you want to do that once a day, that can be done. One of the cooler things. All right. I didn't want to show this, but I'm going to slightly show it because um, <laughs> I'm already on the tab. Yeah. You know, is this also this little thing set up replication? Well, we've already got that other cluster over there deemed to be basically a replication target. So if you have site A and site B, you can do per virtual machine replication from one site to another. And this is what Phil is going to go into in depth uh, uh, on the, uh, basically on the system. No, I'm Across sure you're, you're active in social, therefore you'll know the contentious argument that is snapshots and replication does not equal backup. I agree. Right. He did. Yep. So, so that's going back to the point of backup. Right. So I mean, the replication's cool, you know. Yeah. No, it's basically cool. the, the export component. <laughs> basically exporting to, you know, basically any type of third-party source that, you know, can take, you know, SMB, NFS, stuff like that. Sure. Okay. To add to a previous question that Christopher was talking about, so the, the storage behind this... What are you doing? Are you doing some sort of raid? Are you? I mean, what's we built it. That's all Scribe. It's all the Scribe clustered. He he, he, he built Scribe and stuff like that, right? He built Scribe. Right. So. Essentially, we're just striping blocks across all the disks in the cluster, and uh, that's configurable per virtual device. So. Is it an object kind of store, a file based one, or no? We we, we use the raw devices, and we okay block based. Yeah. We have a Phil, video online, right, from uh, yeah. Storage it was April. April yeah. Yeah. It's like, like Phil yeah, goes very deep in describing. He's actually going to go into it uh, a little bit later as well. I'm going to give a summary. It's, it's not going to go as detailed as that uh, right. storage field day presentation was. But so uh, Is it possible to tie in some open source SDN to be used with KVM? Because this is essentially KVM under the covers. Yes. And in our longer term product roadmap, uh, we are going to have effectively full um, uh, open V switch and open flow capabilities mm. within the system. Okay. We want the cluster to be able to control the switching component as well. Yeah. So that's, uh, I mean, that's, that's really the, 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 that's the, one of the big focus components. And that question brought to you by Sean Massey. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so with that, you know, I don't want to take too much of these guys' time. 
Th that's the demo, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's like I go in, I create VMs, I can move them around, I can do uh, these components, so I can, we'll show you the in, in more in depth, like setting up the, uh, the replication pieces. It was designed to be simple. Simplicity was that core design tenant. Um, uh, one other thing. Can, can the admin provide uh, basically this interface to certain users? So is there role based or anything like that? There's no role, ba role based administration in it yet. Uh, but primarily that also comes down, once again, it's one of those things on our roadmap, but uh, from a, a product management priority perspective, the, the typical customer base we're selling into the, are, aren't requesting it. I'm going to ask the question that I hate the answer to in general, IPv6. I don't care about it personally, but I know people ask it all yeah, the time. Yeah. So, the, uh, uh, Currently we're not using it, but there's no reason we can't. So, Cloud? Uh, working towards... Uh, <laughs> Cheers. I, 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 will, uh, I, I will talk to you next uh, virtualization field day that we do. Um, no, we, no, the reality is uh, we are working on uh, effectively beta services right now. Actually, Mike is, is one of the guys who's principal in, in heading that up. Um, we, we've got a little demo that we do where, you know, you, when you go through and you set up the replication component, which he's going to set up, where it's got this little thing called, oh, scale cloud services within there. So if you're an SMB, you don't have site B, you got a site A, but you want to effectively, you know, get your data off and to, you know, some other service, um, that is going to be something that we're going to be offering. So is that back up to the cloud or DR? DR? That is going DR. to start out being back up to the cloud. It's going to evolve into DR. And when we get the full like, software defined networking stack in there, it's going to effectively be cloud bursting. So you can actually take and run your applications either local, on-prem, or you can run them in the cloud. So we are planning on being that, uh, you know, the effectively the hybrid cloud provider for that. Does so. that grow you into a more enterprise-y friendly product or is we'll see. still going to see more SMBs? I, th I think testing? the real growth aspect for this market is mid-market and SMB. Yeah, I think it's exposing those features to them that they there, weren't available to. There are 500 Fortune 500 companies. There are 380,000 <laughs> SMBs that fit our perfect target market. And, and if I could add, a lot yeah. of SMBs haven't gone to virtualization yet. Yeah. Or they're just partial. Oh, we know that. Sorry. Or they're, you know, or they go through. I mean, we get a lot of guys that are, you know, effectively they, they've got that three to one architecture. They're running VMware Essentials Plus, and then they're about to add that fourth server, and then enterprise licensing just boom, smacks them upside the head, and they're like, wow, that got a lot more expensive. <laughs> right? What's your licensing model? <laughs> ah. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Let's get into that. A, licensing. Licensing. <laughs> Quick question uh, Is it local authentication, or can you do? Like an LDAP or AD? Um, it's local. It's local. Yeah, I mean, there's no role based I mean, stuff. I mean, -based so yeah, it's, it's, it's local. So like, it's literally, it's like, yeah, you log in as admin, the password is scale. I'll tell you right now. Admin. <laughs> yeah, don't change the password. Yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about scaling, too, real quick. Um, and we'll do the cord pull a little bit later on. Um, I got a video that shows a cord pull, but why the hell do a video when you can just pull the cord? I mean, we got them right there. Um, <laughs> So scaling the environment too. Scaling the environment is a non-disruptive scaling component. So you like say so you go in here, you're starting to add a few more virtual machines into the environment. Da, da, da. Warning, you've gotten into basically insufficient memory to start all the VMs. So if there happens to be a failure on one of the particular nodes, you don't have enough to actually run all those uh, virtual machines. So what do you do? You basically add a node, you give it an IP. It says, hey, I see you got a cluster. You want me to join it? Yep, boom, resource pops up, node comes in. And then you can basically take and migrate your workloads over to those other nodes within the cluster. Simple. Once again, that is a that is a you know ten minute process. Slide. I like <laughs> to call the punchline. <laughs> how are you discovering that that other node? Is to, it just pops up in the network? How? Do you need to give it an IP before yeah. you need to do just it? Just give yeah. it an IP. You have to point it to yeah. the existing cluster. Point it to the IP and say. But will like, it get a DHCP one initially or something? Like how are you going to configure the first IP to even get it on the network? You can, you can pick any of the other monitor, yeah, monitor. yeah, and just give it an I mean, initial IP. Just give it, yeah, so you give it an IP and then you tell it basically an IP of another node in the cluster. It doesn't matter which one. How do you give it an IP? But oh, you know, you console in. Basically, you basically, yeah, you just console. You can run VGA, you can hook up to serial, you, know, you can do okay. anything, blah, blah, blah. Um, Punchline slide. Well, this is all great. Yeah, look at this. Like, how much does it cost? Start out a three node. This is the price of a three node cluster to start out. You can start out. Yep. The 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 yeah. 
So $25,500 is the initial starting price for the system. No real rocket science in how much does an additional node cost, take that original price divided by three, and that's what the <laughs> per node pricing is. Um, that includes everything. That is all the servers, that is all the storage, that is all the uh, licensing for every feature. We do not do per feature licensing explicitly because of the market that we serve. Because that's one of the things that just drives those guys nuts. And it drove me nuts. That's all I know, right? Uh, the, the, uh, I was a proud NetApp customer for, for many years, but when I came to that licensing page and there were like 148 options of things that I could license, that I, that I was just pissed off that that was not included, then, then, then you know, I'm like, we are not doing that with our company. That's everything. That also includes a year of premium tech support, which is all we offer. We only do premium tech support 24-7, 365. That is the support that we offer. We have the capability, I didn't show you this, but we have the capability to remote into the boxes. So if you've got a problem, call up our support team, they give you a support code. That creates a secure tunnel to our remote support server where our guys can get console level access on, on the cluster in a matter of seconds instead of a matter of hours to get a tech on site. Where is the support organization based at? Indianapolis, Indiana. Right. <laughs> you guys do remote health checks? Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. And the, that also includes remote the you know, starter cluster price, that includes remote installation services too. Any so. customers that yeah. don't allow you to remote in? Very few. I mean, you know, there's a few. We got a couple of Air Force bases and stuff like that. And we got ways of, of supporting dark sites as well. I mean, we can ship USB sticks and basically walk, walk folks through uh, anything like that. A majority of our customers, though, are just like, oh, hell no. If you could actually just be remoted in all the time and, and run my environment, that'd be great. Right? <laughs> so it's a, once again, it's a, it's a service of the market that the, the, the we're going after. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there are, there are a few in there. So how much is support after the first year? Uh, 12 to 14 percent, depending on the actual like product model. So, what's probably your biggest customer as far as nodes? Breed and aggregates in London. They've uh, they've got how many? They just bought three eight node uh, HC four thousand systems this last quarter. Okay. So, what's the range on the uh, raw storage? Why is it not just? It depends. I mean, it's basically it's like what well, it's the whatever disks you can put in there, right? And uh, you know, primarily we're we're basically uh, a SATA and SAS. We get asked all the time, like, what about SSD? Well, one of the funny things in the way the storage is architected is we don't need SSD, especially the marketplace that the, the, that we serve. There are a few applications that actually need it. One of the cool things we'll talk about the next virtualization field day is the ability to add SSD when you need it. Um, that said, this cluster is SSD. That is running. That's a full SSD cluster right there. Um, it. Yeah, <laughs> like it. <laughs> it was spinning disk. I'd kick it not as hard, right? <laughs> so, no, don't don't want those heads heads to see too much. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is this is effectively the pricing of the product. Uh, you go and you, you configure it comparably equipped. So if you want a, a, go on VMware's cost calculator. You want a system that can run 50 virtual machines uh, in that environment. When you get, you know, you go through their cost calculator, it's going to be effectively a $150,000 purchase to get a system that can run 50 virtual machines. Four, four node, four node HC4000 can do it, and, and we can do it for about 50 grand, including the switching and including Microsoft, yeah, well, partially including Microsoft licensing. Depends on the way you want to license it. So, I mean, just on the HC1000, if you're running that and you start running out of, out of a bit of RAM, can you stick some more in, or are you then obliged to... We up have memory upgrade options for uh, some of the nodes. We don't specifically have it for the HC1000, but, but 2000 and, and 4000, there are memory upgrade paths. You can take this thing, instead of putting 128 gig in the HC4000, we can do 256. We like to call it our in-and-out burger secret menu uh, of options. <laughs> but we go through and we have our SEs really look at the environment and see why you need that. Yeah. But we really did spec that hardware out because it was really good for running that specific size of workload. So you don't fill up your DIMM slots, for example? Right, with the yeah. <laughs> nope. So, um, with that, here's like couple of slides about stuff, where it fits. One thing, you know, so I want to hit on this. Yeah, we got over a thousand customers. We got 4,500 units in the field. Something that we're super proud of, net promoter score of 79. We have maintained a net promoter score in the, in the 70s since we launched the product. And 
If you guys aren't familiar with how those work, I can assure you you've always been subjected to those surveys. It's like on a, on a scale of 1 to 10, how likely are you to recommend this company and their products for, you know, to someone else, right? <laughs> and the reality is there's only three ranges of numbers that matter. If it's a 9 or a 10, it gives you a plus 1. If you are a 7 or 8, it gives you a 0. And if you're 6 or below, negative 1. So you've got a possibility. You ask 100 people, you've got possibility of a score between negative 100 and positive 100. In the IT industry, all the big guys that you know of, if it's, an, if it's a score above 20, it's classified as good tech support. And the majority of the guys are there. They're in the mid-20s. You know, a certain like building that we might be standing in, they may be like 26-ish. Um, but the um, anything over 40 is classified as world-class support. We have maintained a net promoter score in the mid-70s since we launched this product because of the way that, for us, tech support is as much of a product to these mid-market guys as any of the 10 silicon and software that we ship. That, I mean, that is a crucial component of, of what we actually sell. You can imagine, basically, from a vertical perspective, we're pretty much all across the, 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 the space. Now, you know, I'm sitting here, I'm just like, we don't sell to enterprises. Well, certain enterprises come to us, right? But a majority of these, it looks a lot more like mid-market. NATO, that's, that's a mid-market company, right? You know, so, but that's like the Special Operations Command in Belgium, right? That's like three IT users that are supporting, you know, uh, like 300, uh, 300 customers of their product. You know, Oxford, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a department, like the Department of Genealogy within Oxford. Um, so, you know, a lot of these, you know, where we do see it, it's more remote office branch officer departmental. Majority of our customers, unless you live in the same town as these guys, you probably never heard of them. We like to say it's like, you know, when, when the big companies go in to sell something, you know, they fly into the airport and then they'll take like a, like a 45 minute drive out to that big customer. Mm. All those companies that go by in the middle, mm. yeah, it's our customer, right? <laughs> right. So, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so you, you actually had, I mean, I noticed on the first slide, you had an MBA mm -hmm. team on there. So I figured they're probably using a larger scale, right? The, who was? The Pacers. Oh yeah, no, they're, they're they got just basically a stock cluster. They're not that big. Colbert Report. Colbert. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. Just Stephen <laughs> Colbert. It's like Colbert Report brought to you by Scale Computing. Just one thing to check what you mean, just on semantics. Going back, uh -huh. back to the slide that had you was it the leading hyperconvergence or you had a term there on the top. Yeah, Everybody market says leader that. and hyperconvergence. <laughs> yeah. Wait, market leader. <laughs> you know why? Market leader. Nobody else has got those. Yeah, that's true. Nobody else has got a thousand customers. Could be based on that. You know what? Yeah. The, they may have that many employees, <laughs> but they don't have that many customers. <laughs> shouldn't that say, was that a dig? Uh, I'm sorry. Awesome. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> but, but shouldn't that say in your market versus you know market lead? No. No. no? Is he saying based on customers deployed? Yeah, more customers. It depends on your metric. Yeah. Is it yeah, revenue or customers? Yeah, yeah. Support. Hey, guess what? Our metric. stuff is is more affordable. Do we have the revenue <laughs> run rate of some of the other guys in the space? Yeah. No, we don't. They are, but but guess what? Market. Hey, I'll tell you another little factoid. Mm. Yeah. How many employees are working at Scale Computing? Yeah, Three. seventy-five. Exactly. Yeah. We have a fifteen to one customer to employee ratio, and that's how you build a sustainable business. And that could be. Not that. Having, like, it can. It just depends profit. who those customers are, right? Profit. It's profit. So yeah, profit. it's we're, we we are building scale computing to be a real company, right? So it isn't already <laughs> a best. <laughs> <company. laughs> uh, Good answer. Good answer. <laughs> Smart ass. <laughs> we're very real. We're building a very real long-term company. We want to build long-term viability. That's what we're gunning for. So, uh, da, da. we do have rolling upgrades. That's cool. Um, if you want to talk about that, that's great. But I feel like I have gone way over time. Yeah. And these guys need to actually show you some cool stuff. Because we need to get to more demos and less slides.